Hello and welcome. Today I'll be touching on an extremely sensitive subject for Muslims, especially so-called moderate Muslims who are suffering from cognitive dissonance and are trying to deny Islam's original teachings. Whenever Muslims and non-Muslims debate, it's always a matter of time before Muhammad's marriage to six-year-old Aisha is thrown into the mix. This video will be tackling the issue of paedophilia and child marriage in Islam. Does Islam endorse paedophilia and child marriage or is this a negative misconception with no foundation in Islam's teachings? You'll be glad to hear there won't be any inappropriate images in this video, but to explain this matter in detail, I will be explaining hypothetical situations that are made permissible in Islam which some people may find repulsive to hear, but we all need to know what's at the heart of Islamic jurisprudence. I will be digging in very deep into the topic to show you exactly how child marriage is addressed in the Quran as well as in Sharia law, so bear with me for what will be a fairly long video. So let's get going. Now, I don't really want to focus on Aisha in this video because I can make my point here very easily without having to divulge in the question of whether she was actually nine lunar years when she lost her virginity. But I feel this topic would not be complete without a brief mention of her controversial marriage to Muhammad. Excuse me, infidel. Oh no, not you again, Mr. Apologetic, who doesn't seem to listen to evidence and has no rational argument whatsoever. Look. You atheists are all the same, trying to tarnish the image of our beloved prophet, peace be upon him. Aisha's age was not nine when she was married. Yeah, I, I know she wasn't. She was six when she was married, according to the authentic hadith, and nine when she lost her virginity. Those numbers are false, because if you look at other hadiths, alongside a number of assumptions and calculations, you'll see she was significantly older. None of those other hadiths cite her age. Some of them aren't even considered authentic, and you arrive at an older age by spinning through hoops and making plenty of unwarranted assumptions to reach your conclusion. Out of interest, why do you deny Sahih Hadiths where Aisha herself states her age as nine? Aha, I'm glad you asked. You see, Bukhari and Muslim, who compiled those Hadiths, made the error of using Hadiths with Hisham ibn Urwa in their chain of narrators. And some modern-day clerics say he was old and possibly senile, where he could get confused. So, let me get this straight. You're saying Bukhari, who dedicated his entire life to only recording authentic hadiths, and painstakingly researched all his sources and narrators made a fundamental error? Um, yes. So, Hisham ibn Urwa is not credible enough for you, even though these hadiths are authentic? Correct. Okay. Well, here are two more authentic hadiths, clearly stating Aisha's age as nine, and neither of them contain Hisham in their chain of narrators. Well, Aisha was very mature for her age, even if she was nine. Not according to this hadith, which clearly says she was playing with dolls and the official commentary to Bukhari explains she was allowed to play with her dolls whilst she was in Muhammad's house as a bride because she was yet to reach puberty, given that dolls were forbidden at the time for adults as they resembled idols. Um, well, other religions have child marriages too. Um, King John of England married a 12-year-old in the year 1200. So what? Wasn't Muhammad supposed to be the perfect human according to Islam and the ultimate example? If he married a 6-year-old, what kind of example was he setting? Look, I don't care what you just said, and I don't care about your sources. It's all lies. He's perfect, and I can only pray for Allah to guide you. Okay, you're putting your head in the sand again, and choosing to delude yourself in the face of hard evidence. Islam is perfect and you're going to hell, you infidel. Allahu Akbar! Okay, anyway, that's Aisha's marriage dealt with. Let's see what the Quran says on this issue. Divorce is lawful in Islam and is regulated fairly clearly in the Quran. If a woman gets divorced before vaginal intercourse has taken place between the partners, she can get married again immediately and does not have to sit out a waiting period referred to as the Udda in Arabic. This is made clear in Surah Al-Ahzab, verse 49. O oh, you who believe, when you marry the believing women and then divorce them before you touch them, you have in their case no term which you shall reckon. So make some provision for them and send them forth a goodly sending forth. So the rule is clearly no waiting period for women who didn't have sex in their marriage before their divorce. As for women who have had vaginal intercourse during their marriage and were divorced, Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 228, states that they need to wait for three menstrual cycles. 
Women who are divorced shall wait keeping themselves apart three courses, and it is not lawful for them that they should conceal that which Allah hath created in their wombs if they are believers in Allah and the last day. So the Quran now stated that a woman needs to wait for three menstrual periods following her divorce before she can remarry, but does not need to delay remarriage if she never had intercourse with her husband. This caused a problem for the Arabs who knew this waiting period only applies to menstruating women. So they went back to ask Muhammad what the waiting period would be for those who are not menstruating, namely young girls who have yet to hit puberty, old women who have reached menopause and pregnant women. This is detailed in several places such as Asbab al nuzul the Islamic text which describes the context behind the Quran's verses. It states, when the waiting period for divorced and widowed women was mentioned in Surah Al-Baqarah, Ubay ibn al-Ka'ab said, O Messenger of Allah, some women of Medina are saying, there are other women who have not been mentioned. He asked him, and who are they? And he said, those who are too young, those who are too old, and those who are pregnant. And so this verse was revealed. Such of your women as have passed the age of monthly courses, for them the prescribed period, if ye have any doubts, is three months. And for those who have no courses, it is the same. One of the most respected Islamic commentaries is crystal clear on what this verse means. The Jalalain exegesis describes these girls who have yet to start menstruating clearly, and also for those who have not yet menstruated because of their young age, their period shall also be three months. Tanwir al maqbas says the following, And for such of your women as despair of menstruation because of old age, if ye doubt about their waiting period, their period of waiting shall be three months. Upon which another man asked, O Messenger of Allah, what about the waiting period of those who do not have menstruation because they are too young, along with those who have it not because of young age? Their waiting period is three months. So we can clearly say the question that was asked to Muhammad at the time was, what about those who are too young to have menstrual cycles? The other two major exegeses in mainstream Islam are Ibn Kathir and Al-Tabari, who are both very clear that this is referring to girls at a young age, and not to girls who have reached their late teens without menstruating. Al-Tabari says this is in reference to young girls who have been divorced by their husbands after intercourse. With Ibn Kathir, he quotes a companion of Muhammad asking him about the waiting periods for young girls, old women, and pregnant women. And Muhammad revealed this verse in response. Some Muslims try to claim that those who have yet to menstruate is referring to women whose periods are delayed due to medical reasons. But as we've just seen, all the main Muslim commentaries on the verse and the literal reading of the verse are in agreement that this means young girls who have not yet reached puberty. The verse here clearly shows that there is no minimum age for marriage in Islam and girls who haven't reached puberty can be married. Some apologists have recently tried to ignore this verse altogether and quote another verse to claim the Quran forbids the marriage of children. They use this verse in Surah An-Nisa verse 6 to make their point and test the orphans until they attain puberty. Then if you find them in maturity of intellect, make over to them their property. The word used here for puberty can also be translated as marriageable age. But the verse is clearly talking about the ideal time when a guardian can hand over the property and money of an orphan back. It is not referencing marriage itself, only how to deal with orphans regarding their property. Apologists' use of this verse is dishonest, especially when we look at the major commentaries on this verse. We see the major ones all speak about this verse in its proper context, which is handling the property of an orphan. And they also say the verse is referring to the orphan boys, specifically who have hit puberty. Ibn Kathir says, According to the opinion of scholars, test the orphan boys when they have a wet dream and reach puberty. Tabari says, test the orphan in his opinion and mindset. Once his guardian knows he is mature, his property is handed over to him. Both commentaries are clear in showing that the verse is unrelated to marriage and not setting a minimum age for marriage at all. Let's now take an honest assessment of what Islamic laws, often known as Sharia law or Islamic jurisprudence, actually say in regards to child marriage. I need to explain two points so the rest of this video makes sense. The first point is that Islamic law in this day and age is determined primarily by five major schools of thought, which are responsible for the jurisprudence of the vast majority of today's Muslims. Four of these are Sunni. They are Hanafi, Hanbali, Shafi'i, Maliki, and the Shia one is Ja'fari. Keep this in mind because we'll be assessing the position of these schools of thought. Nearly all Muslims today belong to one of these schools of thought. The second thing I need to mention before explaining in detail the position of Sharia on child marriage is a well-known Islamic concept with regards to jurisprudence. Everything is halal unless explicitly forbidden. 
In Arabic, this is referred to as the well-known law of jurisprudence, al-aslu fil ashya al-ibaha. This means everything is allowed in Islam unless there is a Quranic verse or authentic hadith clearly banning it. This is mentioned in the commentary for mainstream Islam's second holiest text, volume 17 of Fath al-Bukhari, page 28 states, Matters are lawful by default only when the Sharia explicitly states that it is not lawful. If any Muslim apologist wants to claim that marrying a girl who has yet to reach puberty is forbidden, you need to provide evidence. And frankly, you'd be contradicting the Quran's message in chapter 65 verse 4, which I quoted earlier along with the position of the major Islamic scholars on it. But the important thing to know here is that you need to provide evidence when saying anything is forbidden. This is a fundamental rule of Sharia law. Let's now take a look at whether there is a minimum age for marriage in Sharia. Let's pick up Fath al-Bari, an exegesis of Sahih Bukhari, volume 11, page 25. It says, Muslim schools of jurisprudence unanimously allow the marriage of young girls, even if they were still babies in the cradle, but intercourse cannot occur until the girl can withstand penetration. That was just a quote I read. This clearly tells us that a Muslim man can marry a baby girl within Sharia law, but cannot have vaginal intercourse with her unless she can withstand it. This rule is universal for the four Sunni schools of thought. The Shia Ja'fari school of thought also has no minimum age for marriage, but sets the age at which sexual intercourse can occur at a minimum of nine lunar years. It must be noted here that barring intercourse, all types of sexual pleasure can take place with any girl, even babies. Iran's Ayatollah Khomeini spells this out very clearly in his book, Tahrir al-Wasila, volume 2, page 216 that a man can carry out all the sexual pleasures he desires on his bride, even if she was a baby. He is entitled to thigh her, that is, placing the penis between the thighs of the baby, heavily kiss the child, grope her body with sexual lust, and so on. They cannot, however, have sex with her until she is nine, according to Shia Islam. But with Sunni Islam, there is no minimum age for sex, so long as the child can withstand intercourse. Next, we move on to when the time comes for a girl to withstand intercourse is determined. Let's turn to the commentary for Sahih Muslim called Sharh Muslim, volume 3, page 577. We see here that all the Sunni schools of thought agree that if the girl's father and the husband both agree that the girl is ready for intercourse, the man can have intercourse with her regardless of age. Just think about that for a second. We're now talking about consent as well, and the girl has no consent here whatsoever. The matter is firmly between the father and her husband. The girl has no option. In fact, she could even be too young to speak, as there is no minimum age limit for marriage. The only time a girl can give her opinion is if she is married after she has already hit puberty. If there is disagreement between the girl's father and the husband over whether a girl is able to withstand intercourse, according to the Hanbali sect, the girl waits until she is nine years old, before being forced to join her husband regardless of what she or her father think. This is purely rape. As I explained already, there is no minimum age for intercourse with a small girl in Sunni Islam. Scholars, however, have said in Radd al-Muhtar, volume 5, page 283, the following. Intercourse is not limited to any age. For example, a fat young girl can withstand penetration at a very young age. So to sum up, the five major schools of Sharia in Islam are unanimous over the fact that there is no minimum age for marriage whatsoever, and a girl can be married off the day she is born. The Sunni schools of thought say there is no minimum age for sex, but there has to be a consensual agreement between the husband and father of the young girl to determine when she is ready for sex. While the Shias say nine lunar years is the minimum age a girl has to reach before her husband can have sex with her. Nine lunar years equates to just under eight regular years and nine months. All types of sexual pleasure, including thighing, hand jobs, French kissing, are allowed with girls as young as babies. All the references backing up the content of the video are in the description box as usual, but in case deluded Muslims want to tell me that I'm making this up, here are a few Muslim clerics clarifying the issue too. دكتور أحمد يعني إذا كبرت حتعتبره أبوها المولى رباها حيكون في مكانة أبوها لا ما هو رباها لا زوجها أصبح زوجها إذا مات ترثه على أوراق زوجها لكن هي أنا أتحدث نفسيا يعني يعني رضيعة يعني رضيعة يعني إذا مين ما تبناها سواء زوجها أو انظر التشريع الإسلامي نعم أنا ما أنا أنا يستطيع أن يتزوج من رضيعة هذا ما قلته دكتور أحمد 
نعم صح يعني انا بتكلم عن هذا وبقول يعني نحن مركزين على النقطه دي لا هي نقطه جزئيه بسيطه جدا لا. يعني ولكن اثار جدل كبير وراجل قال لك البنت عندها 9 سنين تعاشر احسن من عندها 20 واحنا مين بن مختلفين في سن الزواج ورفع سن الزواج نرفعه ولا ما نرفعوش الوضع ده ايه تسع سنين تنفع هو الرجل ده بي بيتكلم كلام هو اولا ليس هناك في الشرع تحديد لسن الزواج على طول كده ليس هناك في الشرع تحديد لسن الزواج يعني ولكن اللي, اللي فهمته كده اللي فهمته كانك موافق نعم انت بتأيد الفتوى دي مش بأيد الفتوى دي ده ده مش بأيد الفتوى دي يعني تسع سنين تنفع انت انت ان تحتمل الزوج يعني تحتمل المعاشره تحتمل الزوج تحتمل البنت الزواج. تحتمل الزواج من عندها كام سنه نعم انا ما اعرفش بقى ما هو ما هو في عندها في عندها هقول لسيادتك الجدات عندها دي. 15 سنه ومقروضه قد كده هو وما تنفعش الحاجه وما تعرفش حاجه في واحده عندها 10 سنين وتلاقيها بسم الله ما شاء الله قد الحيطه مثلا مم. مم. هي العمليه بتتوقف عليه يعني علي مش مش مرتبطه بسن لا مش مرتبطه يعني الشرع لم يعني يحدد بنت سن. بنت عندها تسع سنين وقد الحيطه تنفع آه. تتجوز؟ اه ما ينفعش ليه؟ طب اكيد اتصلوا بينا على 91 235 اصل انا مش في مود مناقشتك النهارده غير الشيخ كلام صعب قوي تسع سنين وتتجوز ده تسع سنين وتتجوز اذا قلت اذا اذا, إذا كانت قد الحيطه تطيق الفحل يعني اللي هي بيقول ايوه ما هي هي في الشرع بشكر دكتور ياسر واكثر صراحه من بعض الاعضاء اللي حاولوا يلتفوا حول تفسير موضوع زواج الاطفال الصغيرات وان هو كان اكثر صراحه لدرجه ان هو قال كمان ما اشترطش سن البلوغ ده حتى يعني فسر الايه الكريمه لمن لم تحب بعد يعني ممكن في اي سن ان شاء الله ثلاث سنين طالما بامكانها انها يعني تطيق طب ايه تفسيرها عندك يا دكتور؟ معلش انا عايز تفسير الايه عندك يا دكتور. ثاني اكمل يا دكتور ياسر. جيبوا لي تفسير عند اي عالم من اهل العلم في الايه، انا بقول ايه من كلام الله. حضرتك قلت والتي لم تحب. اه ما انا بتكلم على ايه مش بتكلم على انا. ده انا بقول ركان الله. ما انا عارفه حضرتك ما انا بقول حضرتك. ما تقولوش تفسير، اصل انا ما فسرتش. طيب طيب. ده ربنا اللي بيقول ولا ايه؟ يعني انتوا معتقدين صحتها ولا مش مش معتقدين صحتها؟ معتقدين القران ولا مش معتقدين القران؟ ده ده معناه في اي سن يا دكتور ياسر مش شرط كمان سن البلوغ يعني انا بقول لحضرتك انت مقتنع بالقران ولا لا Finally there are a couple of hadiths I'd also like to quote which highlight Muhammad's inappropriate behavior around young children Now I must stress the first one is graded hasan which is the second highest rating you can give a hadith following sahih Coincidentally the hadith rated hasan is actually about Muhammad's grandson named Hasan The hadith narrated by Abu Huraira has Muhammad going into a mosque before asking for his grandchild. Where is the little one? Call the little one to me. Hassan came running and jumped into his lap. Then he put his hand in his beard. Then the Prophet opened his mouth and put his tongue in his mouth. Then he said, Oh Allah, I love him, so love him and the one who loves him. Remember that Muslims are encouraged to follow Muhammad's example in their daily lives. An old man today can very easily grab his grandson and stick his tongue down his throat and cite this hadith as his justification for doing so that he is just basically showing his love the same way Muhammad showed his love to his grandchild. But it turns out that's not the only Islamic source to talk about Muhammad sticking his tongue in other people's mouths. Let me clarify, all the video so far has been from absolutely solid indisputable sources for mainstream Muslims. This last one I will mention is only believed to be true amongst some Shias. In the modern revised Shia version of Muhammad's biography, named Sirat al-Mustafa, we find on page 81 we are told about the birth of Ali, Muhammad's cousin and future son-in-law. Muhammad, who at this time was still not claiming prophethood, does the following, and I quote the fourth paragraph. Many narrations say Ali avoided suckling his mother Fatima bint Asad's breast for three days because Muhammad was feeding him his saliva through tongue suckling, leaving Ali full. So Muhammad presented his tongue and saliva as food for Ali for three days. But you know what, let's be kind and leave all the tongue suckling aside given its authenticity can be legitimately disputed. I'd like Muslims to ask themselves honestly, how can they still call this a beautiful religion when the Quran and mainstream Sharia unanimously allow a baby girl to be married off to fulfill all the man's sexual desires even if she was as young as a baby? All except intercourse, that is, which is only when she is deemed ready to withstand penetration, however young she is for Sunnis and nine lunar years for Shias. How can you deny that pedophilia has nothing to do with Islam anymore? Do you really think a great God would allow this behavior? 
If you really want to claim all the Islamic sources have misunderstood the true meaning of the verses and hadiths used to compile Sharia, then why would an all-knowing God not make it crystal clear that child marriage is strictly forbidden? Please think about this honestly with yourself and don't put your head in the sand to avoid this problematic issue. That's all for this video. As always, my sources are always stated in the description box where I have even provided some extra links to Muslim pages stating similar statements to the ones I've made on the video. So before any Muslims have the typical knee-jerk reaction they have on all my videos, please go and read the sources yourself. You can also find links to Muslim websites clearly and unapologetically explaining exactly what I have mentioned in this video, that there is no age limit whatsoever in marriage and sex. Anybody can feel free to mirror any of my videos, but please provide a link back to my channel when doing so. Subscribe to this channel if you haven't already done so, follow me on my social media pages and help support my work on Patreon if you can in any way so I can do more of these videos. Thank you very much for watching.